You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art ed? Who tried to spice it? Who art ed? Mr. Wood art ed me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's I ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to great start. Welcome to Who Arted Weekly Art History for All Ages. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and today, as American voters are on the eve of an election that could give the nation its first female president, I thought it might be nice to do an episode on Rosie the Riveter, an art icon associated with feminism and empowerment. The thing is, there's not just one Rosie the Riveter. So for this episode, I'm going to tackle two of the most famous images. So here we go with A Tale of Two Rosies. Now, first off, let's address whether Rosie the Riveter was in fact a real person. Certainly, there were women named Rosie, and some number of them must have worked as riveters. I mean, I have seen documentation of a Rose Will Monroe who did work as a riveter and was featured in a promotional film as Rosie, but... Rosie the Riveter, the name as we know it in pop culture, seems to have originated with a song. In 1942, Red Evans and John Jacob Loeb penned a song called Rosie the Riveter. It became a nationwide hit in 1943, telling the story of a dedicated woman working in a factory contributing to the war effort. The songwriters chose the name Rosie because it was a common name at the time and because it created alliteration with Riveter, making it more catchy and memorable. While the song provided the name, there wasn't one single Rosie. Instead, Rosie the Riveter became a symbol representing millions of women working in factories and shipyards across the country. Women entering the workforce to help with the war effort identified with the song, and there are some accounts that these workers referred to themselves as Rosies. Now, let's look at one of the most famous images we describe today as Rosie the Riveter. I'm talking about the We Can Do It poster featuring a determined woman with a red bandana flexing her bicep. It's one of the most enduring images of the 20th century. Though it's often referred to as Rosie the Riveter, the poster's true origins may surprise you. In 1943, graphic artist J. Howard Miller created the poster for the Westinghouse Electric Corporation. It was not actually part of the effort to recruit women into the factories to help fill the void left as millions went off to fight on the front lines. The We Can Do It poster was aimed at keeping workers in those jobs. It was part of a wartime campaign aimed at boosting worker morale and reducing absenteeism in their factories. The poster was actually only displayed for two weeks inside the Westinghouse factories in the Midwest. It then came down to make room for the next set of motivational posters, and this version of Rosie the Riveter languished in obscurity for nearly four decades. It wasn't widely distributed or reproduced, and it remained unknown to the general public. Honestly, we don't even have evidence that Miller or anyone else called the woman in the poster Rosie the Riveter. That association would come later. In 1982, Professor Howard Bloch, a historian researching images of women during World War II, stumbled upon the poster in the National Archives. He recognized its potential power and included it in his article, Poster Art for Patriotism's Sake, uh, that he wrote for the Washington Post magazine. The poster's message of strength and determination resonated with the burgeoning feminist movement of the 1980s. Women saw in the image a symbol of female empowerment and a call to action in their fight for equality. As the poster gained popularity, it became mistakenly associated with the name Rosie the Riveter, further blurring the lines between different representations of women war workers. This misattribution, while inaccurate, contributed to the poster's iconic status and its association with female empowerment. The 1980s saw a resurgence of feminist activism focused on issues like equal pay, reproductive rights, and ending sexual harassment. The We Can Do It poster provided a powerful visual symbol for these struggles. 
The poster also evoked a sense of nostalgia for a time when Americans came together for a common cause. Of course, I think it's important to also recognize that the nostalgic view of the nation pulling together for the war effort overlooks some unsettling aspects of that time. Sticking with just the feminist lens, I think it's important to recognize that women were recruited to roll up their sleeves and take on new jobs during the war, but as soon as the war ended, the propaganda shifted to telling women it was their patriotic duty to give up those jobs and let the men take over. In some ways, I think it's poignant that the woman in the We Can Do It poster is an anonymous every woman, representing the strength and resilience of women broadly. Still, given the way that these female workers were relied upon then brushed aside, I think it's worth saying the names of some of the women behind the image. We're not certain of the identity of the woman in the poster. For a long time, people believed it might have been based on Geraldine Hoff Doyle, a Michigan factory worker. Today, though, most historians believe that the poster was likely based on images of Naomi Parker Fraley, who worked in a California naval shipyard. Now, after a short break, I want to take a look at another famous Rosie the Riveter image. Norman Rockwell's version from the Saturday Evening Post. It seems ironic that today the We Can Do It poster is more commonly recognized as the popular culture depiction of Rosie the Riveter, because in the 1940s, few people would have seen that work. The far more famous image was Norman Rockwell's Rosie the Riveter painting. This one was definitely intended to be Rosie the Riveter. I mean, she has a lunch pail that says Rosie on it. Rockwell's painting was featured on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post on May 29, 1943. In it, he depicts a strong, determined woman taking a lunch break with a riveting tool in her lap and a sandwich in her hand. She is wearing work overalls, goggles perched on her head, and her feet rest atop a copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf. Behind her, we see the American flag tying it all together. Rockwell based Rosie's pose on the prophet Isaiah from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling, imbuing her with a sense of power and spiritual significance. There's even a subtle halo effect around her head. Those familiar with Michelangelo's work, like the Sibyls on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, will tell you Michelangelo tended to portray some muscular women. I mean, they look like bodybuilders, and Rockwell did the same with his version of Rosie. In this case, we do actually know the identity of the model. Rockwell based his image on a neighbor, Mary Doyle Keefe, but she didn't look exactly like what we see in the final painting. She was said to be a petite 19-year-old telephone operator, so not a riveter. Rockwell is said to have actually later called O'Keefe to apologize for exaggerating her physique. Still, the image was a hit. The Saturday Evening Post cover was widely circulated, and it was even used in war bond drives, inspiring patriotism and encouraging women to join the workforce. By placing Rosie's feet on Mein Kampf, Rockwell was emphasizing the role of American workers in defeating fascism. The image conveys a sense of national unity and resolve. Rockwell's Rosie embodies the strength and determination of women who entered the workforce during World War II, challenging traditional gender roles and contributing to the war effort. The painting is still heralded as now a part of the permanent collection of the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. Rockwell's Rosie the Riveter painting and J. Howard Miller's We Can Do It have taken on another life far beyond their original purpose. They've become a part of the broader culture as symbols to represent hard work and progress. They've been reimagined and recontextualized for different generations, but while the specific struggles may change with time, the message at the heart of the piece remains the same. 
Rosie embodies the strength and determination of ordinary people facing extraordinary challenges. And she represents the impact that individuals can have when they work together for a common good. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.